Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast. My name is Philip and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 36, Plautus and Shakespeare, Two Brothers. Last time, I looked at the Menachmus Brothers, one of Plautus's most plundered plays by later dramatists. As a partner to that episode, I thought it would be interesting to step out of the Roman timeline for a moment and look at how Plautus came to be a significant influence on the dramatists of the Renaissance and on Shakespeare in particular, where the influence of Plautus on his comedies is already well noted and also can be seen in the comic characters in other plays too. Fellow Roman comic playwright Terence also appears here in comparison to Plautus, as his influence is also present in this period. We will get to Terence properly in the next and subsequent episodes, and hopefully you'll find everything here on him as a primer for that. Before considering how Plautus influences the Renaissance dramatists, I think it would be useful to understand how the Roman plays survived, or didn't survive, since the end of antiquity. In terms of the physical survival of Latin manuscripts, and, as I've mentioned before, after the fall of Rome, Latin and Greek manuscripts were preserved in Byzantium and in European monasteries, particularly in southern Italy. Fortunately, many monks seem to have been happy to preserve manuscripts regardless of their content, so pre-Christian writings, including plays, were kept alongside early and later Christian manuscripts, gathering dust in monastic libraries. And there they lay until the Renaissance period, waiting to be rediscovered. When that happened, it was the works of Terence that were the most popular. This was largely because his form of Latin, which was more modern than Plautus's and therefore more accessible to the then current scholars, were used in schools and universities. Also, there were simply more complete works by Terence available in the early Renaissance. Plautus was mostly known through secondary sources, where he was much quoted in epigrammatic form. The few primary manuscripts that survived were not only very rare, but found to be more inaccessible due to these early Latin forms and made them much harder for the early Renaissance scholars to work with and popularise. The difference between the knowledge and popularity of Terence and Plautus up to the 14th century is really striking. St Augustine quotes Terence frequently, but never Plautus. It's a stark reminder that what we know of the past is dictated entirely by what has survived. The most notable promoters of the Latin texts were Plutarch, born in 1304, and Boccaccio, born in 1313. Both were poets, essayists and Renaissance humanists who corresponded with each other, but they were by no means alone in crafting a new learning from Roman texts. Specifically on the plays, we know that they both copied out Terence, and they both expressed fanboy-like admiration for Plautus, even though they only knew about half of his works that had eventually become available. It wasn't until 1428 that a manuscript containing 12 lost plays by Plautus was discovered, bringing the number up to the 20 complete or near-complete plays that we still have today. Printed but rather imperfect copies of the plays began to appear from 1472 onwards. Over the next century, works were read in the original Latin and translated into Italian, French and German. The German translations were as early as 1475 and there is a suggestion that they may have been performed but the first definitive record of a public performance of Plautus in translation is from Italy. The Menachmus brothers were shown in Ferrara, an Italian city and province located south of Venice and north of Bologna. This was in 1486, as part of Duke Ercole et d'Este's carnival celebrations, organised to celebrate the betrothal of his daughter. The play was one of three presented on successive evenings during the celebrations. The Duke was one of the most significant patrons of the arts in the Renaissance. He was supported politically by the Venetian Republic and through his marriage to Eleonora, daughter of Ferdinand I of Naples, created strong alliances that allowed his province to flourish. He fought off his nephew, the true heir of the province, and attempts by the Pope to absorb the province into the Vatican States. His support of the art was a statement of cultural difference that was part of his political stance. It was a policy that resulted in large-scale and popular events. His theatrical productions were probably the first truly secular theatre presented in Europe since antiquity. The marital production of Plautus was well received, and the Duke oversaw many more productions of Terence and Plautus in Italian over the next 20 years. That first production is recorded by the Duke's biographer, who claims that Menachmus of Epidamnus was shown arriving on a realistic galley with a sail, and the production attracted an audience of 10,000. 
We need to be a bit cautious of exaggeration here, but it's impressive if true. And it probably is, as later productions are also noted for their grandeur, particularly in the construction of sets, the use of stage machinery, and the excellence of the musicians that were brought in from all over Italy and from France. The ongoing popularity of productions the Duke sent out to other parts of the Italian peninsula is also well attested, so much so that his theatre could be considered the preeminent form at that date. With the turn of the 16th century, interest in Terence continued, but also grew for Plautus, who slowly became seen as a more complex dramatist and more worthy of study. In the early 1500s, this gave way to the subgenre of Italian comedy Commedia Erudate, or Learned Comedy, which is best represented by the comedies of Machiavelli. That change in appreciation of the Roman comic writers, which took just a few decades, represents the first time in European culture that questions about how comedy works, what language it uses, and how the audience responds to it were seriously considered. Prior to this, there had been a significant gap in the study of the theory and the stagecraft of comedy. Aristotle may have written a treatise on comedy, as he did for tragedy, but this either never existed or was lost early on, and comedy had been treated as a less serious form than tragedy ever since. The debate on the merits and shortcomings of Terence and Plautus continued throughout the 16th century, with commentators arguing over the comic intent and moral stance of both playwrights. Plautus suffered censorship at times, being thought of as overly crude and harsh, with Terence's reputation benefiting from what was then perceived as his more serious tone, finer Latin and well-constructed plays. That assessment over the language would change in time, as a more detailed understanding of the development of Latin evolved. Also discovered and taken into account was the high praise that Plautus's near contemporaries showered on him. However, the ebb and flow of opinion concerning Terence over Plautus continued more or less through the century, with some finding that the frequent use of punning, wordplay and satire in Plautus left his work less satisfying than that of Terence. These views, coming from the scholarly aristocratic class in Italy, were rooted in class prejudice. They favoured Terence because he was favoured by the more upper-class Romans and disliked Plautus for his championing of the slave and the lower classes. They were also reluctant to place comedy alongside tragedy in the canon for similar snobbish reasons. But what they missed was that where Terence lived on the page, Plautus needed to be performed to be truly appreciated. Antonio Minturo, poet, critic and bishop, writing in the mid-1500s, was one of Plautus's supporters. He wrote a discussion on Cassina, trying to show that, however scurrilous or obscene Plautus may be, there was careful planning and craft to be found in the construction of the play. The problem for many, if not most, remained that it was difficult to see past the pre-Christian morality and social conventions displayed by the characters in the play. The Renaissance in Italy expanded into the rest of Europe, and as it spread north there was an explosion of learning that led to great art, literature and the study of history, and the rediscovery of Rome as a model for politics, art and literature. In northern Europe, Latin comedy in particular was preserved more through the schoolmaster than the artist. Keen to keep the morals of their pupils on track and post-Reformation away from Catholic influence, Plautus and Terence were used in the schoolroom and playwriting in the vernacular and with a moralistic tone developed. Stories like The Return of the Prodigal Son taken from the Bible and other tales were dramatised using the techniques of Roman comedy. Plautine comedy saw translations into Spanish in the 1550s. France soon followed suit and an English version of Amphitrio appears in the 1560s. By that decade, the critical response to Plautus was mostly settled, as summed up by Giovanni Sambuco, who published some Plautine sayings in 1568. He said, Although Terence may be elegant, pure and polished, we may say that Plautus is truly a comic playwright, if indeed we know what it is to write comedy or tell a tale, not only using the hand and the ear, but also careful planning. In England, the flourishing of the Renaissance hit the top of its arc in the Tudor period, and particularly from the reign of Henry VIII, 1509-1547, and his daughter Elizabeth, who reigned 1558-1603. The rise of literacy in the general population had been a long time coming. The need for schooling and a literate lower class had been recognised as far back as the Anglo-Saxon period, when Alfred saw the benefits of learning and a functioning bureaucracy in the court of the Franks across the English Channel. 
His kingdom of Wessex is thought to have had close political links there and imported religious clerks to promote learning in the wider English regions. But it's not until the Renaissance and the Reformation that schools became somewhat detached from monasteries and an alternative to Catholic works for study was sought. The oldest universities in England were already well established, Oxford University having been founded in 1095 and Cambridge in 1209, but in this period they benefited from significant endowment and expansion of their roles. Now, they were not only expected to turn out clerics for the church, but good Tudor citizens who could run the country as loyal servants of the monarch, serving the needs of the growing financial and legal systems. Records preserved in the university show that the participation of students in producing plays became well established by the mid-1500s, and of the 70 performances we have records for, 23 were productions of Plautus or Terence, with Terence once again coming initially out on top in the popularity stakes. English translations of Roman plays appeared as early as 1497 and went into multiple reprints. Original plays adapted from or influenced by the Roman appear in the middle of the century. Plays like Ralph Royster Doyster by Udall used Terence Braggart's soldier character, not Plautus's, and Sir Philip Sidney's Arcadia borrowed structure from Terence. These, Gamma Gurton's Needle and other plays, show the early English comic dramatists using the Roman model, but starting to find their own distinctly English voice too. Study at universities based on Roman literature, politics and debate were built from a grounding given in the expanding school system. Children, and of course I should say boys, born at the end of Henry's reign, in the brief reigns of Edward and Mary, and in the early years of Elizabeth's reign, were the first to benefit from village and town schools that taught a standard syllabus using standard texts. These were first established by Henry and confirmed by Elizabeth. Elizabeth retained the catechism and primers from Henry's time, but for older students the works of St Thomas Aquinas were deemed to be too Catholic, and an alternative for teaching Latin was sought. By this time, the English Reformation had become more than just Henry's desire to move away from the influence of Rome to Elizabeth's more Calvinistic and theologically driven version. The texts that had emerged from antiquity became the standard for education. So the Elizabethan schoolboy became versed in Ovid, Cicero, Livy, Plautus, Terence and others. This was rote learning, where the content of the Latin wasn't studied too closely, but it was a grounding that was built on for those who went on to university to learn the art of Roman debate and rhetoric, along with some Greek and more Latin. Coming up soon, you can hear more about the Elizabethan education system as part of a piece on the life of Christopher Marlowe that I've recorded for the History of England podcast. If you're not already listening to David Crowther's entertaining travels through English history, you might want to pop over there and give him a listen. The story of the life and mysterious death of Christopher Marlowe is a really interesting one that also gives us a window onto Elizabethan society and the shady world where the bright young men of the time were used by those in government for the dirtier side of their work as they searched out the enemies of the Reformation. I really enjoyed researching and recording this piece and I'll let you know when it's out on the History of England podcast. So, we have a Roman Latin influence coming through the education system and an Italian influence coming from published works and performances by troops of Italian actors, some of which was homegrown comedy, but some were performances of Roman comedies in translation. Records show performances at the English court by such troops who travelled throughout Europe. It's interesting to note that the earliest editions of Shakespeare's plays include stage directions that describe characters as the braggart, and the pedant, coming directly from Latin, and descriptions such as the pantaloon and the montebank coming from the Italian tradition. We don't have direct evidence of Shakespeare's education, but as the son of an ambitious father it's reasonable to assume that he did benefit from the town schoolhouse learning. His father, John Shakespeare, had a chequered career, but was at times alderman, magistrate and town mayor, so a man not without ambition although his first recorded municipal appointment sounds like the best job ever. In 1556 he was appointed ale taster for the borough, responsible for tasting the quality and wholesomeness of the beer, ale and the bread, as well as checking the weights and measures and prices being maintained by local shopkeepers. Evidence from within the plays suggests that Shakespeare Jr. was familiar with the Roman comedies, although it's possible that he acquired this familiarity through translations rather than the original Latin. 
His schooling could have given him enough Latin to make his way through original plays, but he clearly had a working French and Italian, and he may have used all of these linguistic skills in his research. And let's not forget that he would have seen productions of plays by travelling troops who made it out to Stratford. During his mayorship, his father is recorded as using public funds to help travelling players to mount a production. Surely, young William would have attended such an event, and perhaps it was that that sparked his interest in the theatre. Once he was established in London, his opportunities to see plays by various authors and in different languages increased greatly. Actual similarities with Plautus in the plays, which might be attributed to knowledge of the originals, starts with the settings. The familiar street scene of the Roman play is carried into the Italian Renaissance drama and is evident in the early English plays already mentioned. In Shakespeare, there are numerous scenes that take place simply in a street, but some more specifically require a house or several houses. The obvious balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet, the running through the streets of Venice in Othello, and the street of, with houses in the Comedy of Errors are a good example. But this, of course, is a Roman trait rather than specifically being after Plautus. Other elements of staging carry similarities. The asides by characters directly to the audience or to themselves for the audience benefit feature heavily in Shakespeare, as does the hidden listener as key plot points are recounted. The slave or parasite character rushing on, breathless in their haste, is common to both and often used for humour in Shakespeare. The prologue gives us more explicit influence. As we've seen in Cassina and the Monachmus brothers, the prologue is not a character in the play, but a commentator on it, but that's not always the case in Plautus. In some plays, the prologue is more like a Greek god, and in some, a character from within the play who steps out momentarily to deliver the commentary or backstory. The delivery of a summary of the plot and the greeting of the audience are the common features that run through Plautine prologues. The greatest of the Shakespearean prologues featured in Henry V and Romeo and Juliet are closest to Plautus in their role and intent, and we also see a very comparable use of epilogue in Henry IV Part II and in As You Like It. The Tempest, for example, ends with Prospero in conversation with Alonso, promising him good winds for his journey home, but it's Prospero who delivers the 20-line epilogue after the other characters have all exited. That mirrors endings only previously found in Plautus. In some cases, the influence of plots is obvious. The Monachmus Brothers is relatively simple compared to the Comedy of Errors, which introduces a second set of identical twins. That idea was probably in turn borrowed from Amphitryon, with the identical slaves being introduced as the slightly more palatable identical serving men. Characters in disguise and playing the part of another character are common to both in multiple cases. But the deceit is for the noble cause, and particularly it concerns the noble slave who employs disguise to assist his master. The other disguise element common to both is the woman disguised as a man. All of the Shakespearean heroes who partake in this, Viola, Rosalind, Portia and others, have prototypes in the Italian comedies and plautus. For Plautus, such disguises could be affected by the change of a mask and maybe costume. For Shakespeare, it was a case of a boy actor playing a woman disguised as a man, which seems like it would be harder to pull off. But Shakespeare's heroine certainly retain a charm that speaks to his skills at writing truly female roles. The reverse situation, the man disguised as the bride, is known to us from Cassina and used by Shakespeare rather more obliquely in the opening of The Taming of the Shrew and at the end of The Merry Wives of Windsor. In that case, Dr Caius and Slender both grab hold of a fairy, whom they take to be Mistress Page, but then in fact realise that they've been married to a boy. The braggart soldier has had the most popularity as a character since Plautus. He features heavily in the Italian comedies and reaches his pinnacle in the Shakespearean Falstaff. The attraction to both actor and audience is perhaps obvious. He has a proud military background and is often the doer of fabled deeds in his youth, but there's a question about how honest his retelling of these brave deeds is. He's loved by his entourage and the women in his life, but he's doomed to fail and converge on the melancholic. Falstaff is not alone, of course. The character traits can be found in Bardolf, Nim and Pistol in Henry V, Sir Andrew Aguecheek in Twelfth Night and Sir Hugh Evans in The Merry Wives of Windsor, among many others. 
all carry the same characteristics of boastfulness of their exploits, past or future, while safe in the domestic setting, but cowardly in the face of danger, real or imagined. They are irresistible to the ladies in their own head, but ultimately are subject to ridicule, some of which is particularly cruel and a sorry end. In Shakespeare, these are no longer the stock characters of Plautus. Part of Shakespeare's genius was to make these minor characters come to life with real personality and, in some cases at least, psychological depths. All of the aforementioned plays are unimaginable without these minor characters, who are retained in the imagination of the audience to almost the same level as the main protagonists. That is particularly true of Falstaff, of course, whose early appearances in both parts of Henry IV as a companion and bad influence on the young Prince Hal proved so popular that a return was demanded. He doesn't appear in Henry V, but is eulogised by Mistress Quickly, and his presence is certainly felt hanging over the remaining minor characters. The final rejection of Falstaff by the Prince as he belatedly resolves to take his duties seriously is an incredibly poignant scene, even though Falstaff isn't present, and is one of my favourites because of the way Shakespeare takes this personal relationship and uses it as a means to discuss the nature of kingship, responsibility and friendship. Falstaff's return in The Merry Wives of Windsor was crafted in response to the character's popularity and includes many plotine features in its plotting the old soldier's arrival on stage as an impoverished traveller and his plan to get money from the merry wives by means of both his charm and deceitfulness all have roots in Plautus, as does the woman's ability to undo those plans. Falstaff is in fact an amalgamation of the braggart soldier and the parasite characters and as such Shakespeare has made something new and so memorable that he remains one of the most popular characters in the Shakespearean canon if not in the entire canon of Western literature to this day. The slave character, so central to Plautus, had changed by Shakespeare's time. In Renaissance Italian drama, he becomes the clever servant, and from there becomes the same or the clever fool in the English plays. The role is no longer that of an instigator, but remains quite similar to the Roman version as a commentator on other characters, both directly in the play, through aside and soliloquy, and as the generator of comedy at the expense of others. The role in Shakespeare includes features like mock debates, the insulting of other servants, sharp retorts to those in authority and the aside to the audience, all of which would have been familiar to the Roman audience. The most obvious examples where the characters are closest to the Plautine slave are perhaps Lancelot Gobbo in The Merchant of Venice and Grumio in The Taming of the Shrew. Plot points concerning the restoration of a lost son are also common, originating as they do from Greek New Comedy. Generally, Shakespeare sticks to his sources and separates children for the preservation of the mother's good name. Think of The Winter's Tale and Cymbeline. But sometimes varies the means of separation. The split in the Comedy of Errors is caused by a storm at sea rather than the original separation at the fair in the Menachmus Brothers. In a similar vein, Shakespeare uses the traditional discovery of some token that identifies the true heritage of the foundling to the same extent and in the same way as it's used in Greek and Roman originals. To take just one example, the stolen ring of a father is often used in the Greek and Roman as a means of identification, and also features or is echoed in Twelfth Night, The Merchant of Venice and Two Gentlemen of Verona. Resemblances in the ever-changing metre of the poetry in the plays by both dramatists is also comparable, but Shakespeare's influences are probably more recent than Plautus. Marlowe and Kidd had already shown the power of varying metre and, in particular, the versatility that blank verse brought to drama. So his choices to move from verse to prose were probably influenced by them rather than directly from Plautus. But in some cases, the tone in Shakespeare is strikingly similar to Plautus, which may well be attributable to Shakespeare's knowledge of the originals and grounding in Latin and Roman rhetorical style. In his excellent survey of the world that Shakespeare grew up in and inhabited, The Soul of the Age, Jonathan Bate considers what Shakespeare's reference library might have looked like, taking into consideration the difficulty and expense of obtaining books at the time. Based on the content of the plays and Shakespeare's other writings, he concludes that at the end of his career, Shakespeare's book chest might have contained about 40 volumes. He places editions of translations and original Latin of Ovid and Plutarch there without a doubt and Livy's History of Rome. Next comes Plautus, specifically because of the debt owed by the Comedy of Errors to the Menachmus brothers. 
Interestingly, he points out that Shakespeare's play was likely written at a time when an English translation of Plautus's play was published, and that there are similarities between this translation and the Shakespearean version of the story. Maybe Shakespeare had an early sight of this new translation, and the idea for the play was prompted. But we also have to recognise that the similarity could be coincidence, as the translation of the Latin is very formal and standard, so lacking in any idiosyncrasies that could be used to prove the link more positively. Professor Bate concludes that on balance he believes Shakespeare would have had a Latin copy of Plautus for his own use. His knowledge of these works could not, he believes, be solely based on remembered school exercises, but must have come from later and specific research of the originals. There is a point where we have to say that although influenced by Plautus and others, Shakespeare was functioning in a very different society and was very much his own man. For one thing, it was a Christian society, so, for example, the Comedy of Errors cannot be left with the morally ambiguous original ending of its predecessor. Shakespeare brings in an abbess who blames witchcraft for the events just witnessed, a solution that belongs firmly in the Christian era and would never have been considered by Plautus. For the same reason, Shakespeare changes the end of source plays to conclude with a multiple wedding, the ultimate Christian happy ending for young couples, but something that was not necessary for the more realistic Roman sensibilities. The worldview of the Comedy of Errors is also much broader than Plautus, with a sense of looking out into the wider Elizabethan world, which at the time was an expanding one where England was playing a major role. Despite being part of an even greater empire, Plautus was always confined to the house and the home and to Rome, however much he contrived to establish a Greek setting. So there seems little doubt that Shakespeare gained influence both directly from the Latin plays and through the other routes via the Italian Renaissance and Northern European educational systems and the drama it produced. It was an influence that pervaded Renaissance drama and its impact on Shakespeare was noted at the time. Contemporary author and commentator Francis Mears directly compared Shakespeare to Plautus, saying, As Plautus and Seneca are accounted the best for comedy and tragedy among the Latins, so Shakespeare among the English is the most excellent in both kinds for the stage. Quite a compliment, but it may also speak to the view that both playwrights were over-fond of the pun and for wordplay over well-crafted plotting. Whichever way you take that, it echoes a reference in Hamlet, when considering the plays suitable for the king's entertainment with the players, he compares the same Latin greats, saying, Seneca cannot be too heavy, nor Plautus too light. Ben Jonson also shows influence from Plautus, particularly in his early works. The Case is Altered is based on two Plautus plays, The Pot of Gold and Captives, and he was an admirer of Plautus's language, agreeing with Varro that he was a prince of letters and elegancy in the Roman language. Although later in his career, Johnson took his lead more from Terence, as he seemed to tire of the audience's reaction to his Plautine comedies. He said of them that they love nothing that is right and proper. The farther it runs from reason or possibility, with them the better it is. Meaning that the more farcical and unbelievable the plot is, the more the audience enjoyed the play. This was a frustration for him as ultimately he became interested in comedy that reflected and mimicked real life and could therefore be justifiably held up alongside tragedy. This is the view that many assume Aristotle would have taken in his lost or unwritten work on the dramatic theory of comedy. The distinctions in the Plautus versus Terence difference have been used by some commentators to describe the difference between the two great Renaissance dramatists of the English stage. If we see Shakespeare as the more naturally gifted and freewheeling playwright, he is indeed the Plautus of his day, while the more studied and learned Johnson sits more closely with Terence. By Johnson's time, the Plautine was most definitely in the ascendant, his exuberant style being more appreciated in the vigorous English and European theatre scene that had developed and flourished. The pendulum has never swung back Terence's way since, and although there are things to admire in his crafted comedies, as we'll see in the coming episodes of the podcast, Plautus retains his premier position for his theatricality and success as a dramatist for performance. Shakespeare was an artist and creator in his own right, who layered these underlying influences with his own creations that made his characters, situations and plays the very special things that they are. 
That was due to both the Roman influence through education and the flowering of European thought and art that he was lucky enough to be part of. He rode that wave with the best of the artists from the period, but I feel sure that, like any literary man or woman of his time, he would have freely acknowledged his debt to Plautus, Terence and the other Latin playwrights and authors that he knew. Next time, it's back to Rome for the life and times of Terence. This moves us forward from Plautus by a generation or so, and we'll look at the changed situation in Rome and, of course, the plays he produced in his relatively short life. I hope you enjoyed this small diversion. It gives us a taste of what is to come some way down the line, and personally, I'm looking forward to getting stuck into this incredible period of theatrical greatness. That's not just for Shakespeare, who I approach with some trepidation, but who is fortunately still far enough away to not distract me too much. But for all the other playwrights and theatrical practitioners, who we now see as revolving around the great man. Please support the podcast by signing up for additional audio content at patreon.com or just to say thanks at ko-fi.com. All contributions help to offset the costs of hosting the podcast and funding the ever-growing pile of research materials and are gratefully received. Please give us a follow on the Twitter account or a like on the Facebook page to join in with the conversation about theatre history and theatre stuff in general. There's a lot of content around Roman history on both platforms and I do my best to pick out the most interesting and particularly the theatre-related items. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. Thank you.